welcome to the Sisterhood of Sweat. I am super excited to have JJ Virgin in the house today. JJ is a celebrity nutrition expert and a fitness hall of famer. JJ Virgin teaches clients how to break through food and carb intolerance so they can finally lose the weight and transform their health and their lives. JJ is a prominent TV and media personality whose previous features include co-host of TLC's Freaky Eaters, health expert for Dr. Phil, and appearances on PBS, Dr. Oz, Rachel Ray, Access Hollywood, and The Today Show. She also speaks regularly and shared stage with notables, including T.D. Jakes, Tony Robbins, and Brendan Burchard. JJ is the author of four New York Times bestsellers, The Virgin Diet, The Virgin Diet Cookbook, and JJ's Virgin Super Impact Diet, and JJ Virgin Sugar Impact Diet Cookbook. Her latest book, Miracle Mindset, shows warrior moms how to be strong, positive leaders for their families while exploring their inspirational lessons. JJ learned as she fought for her own son's life. JJ hosts the popular JJ Virgin Lifestyle Show podcast with over 3.5 million downloads and counting. She also regularly writes for Huffington Post. Rodell, is that how you say it? Rodell. 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 <laughs> Wellness, Mind Body Green, and other major blogs and magazines. Find articles, recipes, helpful online programs, and more at jjvirgin.com. Welcome, JJ, to the show. Good to be here. Yeah, I'm super excited to have you. What's your weather like? Um, well, where do you live? I live in Ohio. Okay, I'm sorry about this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I live in um, Rancho Santa Fe, which is the horse country of San Diego. So it's like 15 minutes up from the beach and everyone lives on a couple of acres with orchards and all sorts of cool stuff. And it's, you know, it's 70 degrees out right now. Yeah, I have a feeling like that you lived in this warm beachy southern california climate i don't know why but you give me this feel when i was like list like listening to a podcast and um just kind of getting a feel for you i was like yeah i feel like she lives in, in california <laughs> so i'm right on the money i've always cool. lived in either southern california well i grew up in northern california but uh then i moved to la and then i moved to fort lauderdale so i've kind of gone between southern california and florida uh, most of my adult life. I like to be warm. I like to have sunshine. So that's it. Yeah. Well, it does put you in a good mood, right? Mm -hmm. And it helps your mindset. Yes. I will go to the places like, I like having big fun coats to wear. So I like to go for two or three days and then I want to leave. <laughs> so I'll go to New York for a couple days, but that's it. That's it. And don't you have some sort of a mindset training now? Um. So I do, I have something called the Miracle Mindset Academy that we built when we did the Miracle Mindset book. And um, it, it's coming back out again at when we launched the book as Warrior Mom here for Mother's Day. We're actually doing something super fun for Mother's Day where we are celebrating warrior moms all over the place. We're giving away really cool gifts, but I want to give recognition to the uns unsung heroes, us women, because I feel like, especially moms, they put themselves last. And uh, I'm, I'm aiming to stop that. So yeah, we did a whole mindset training because really whether you're trying to build an amazing business or have healthy kids, it all comes down to that. Yeah, right? I mean, absolutely. And I, I think that's fantastic that you're giving that to moms and just helping support them. And, you know, sometimes as a mom, you do feel like a warrior. That's for sure. <laughs> you got to be a warrior to be a mom. Are you kidding? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, speaking of that, what inspired you to write your book, Miracle Mindset? 
Um, after I went through what I went through with my son, which my, I, I have two sons and they were 15 and 16 when my 16 year old got hit by a car and left for dead in the street. And it was the most crazy time because I had to fight for his life. The doctors told us to let him die. We overruled them. But at the same time, my first big book, The Virgin Diet was coming out. And the challenge was that I had to make that book work because I'm the financial support for my family. So I'm the sole financial support for my family. And um, I had everything invested in that book and I have to be at the hospital with my son. I'm not leaving. And so it was just a crazy, crazy time. And people after the fact, my son was in the hospital four and a half months. The book became a 26 week New York Times bestseller. I was doing TV you know, I'd literally run out of the hospital, go, go to a studio in LA, tape a show, come back, you know, and people were like, how the heck did you do that? And I go, well, it just, you know, it really came down to, I'm just a warrior mom. We all have it in us. Cause people would say, I could never do that. I go, you would totally do it. You know, if your son's life is at risk, you're going to do what you have to do. But I was fortunate at the time that I built up all of these, this mindset training through a mentor it, 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 when I was 30 and I used all of that to make my way through it. And, you know, you really look at it, whether it's building a business, raising a family, um, succeeding in your career, it all really comes down to mindset, all of it. Being successful with weight loss where I work, you know, it's, it's all mindset. Yeah. I mean, it's just basically your perception and the way you're looking at things and, um, what do you consider a miracle mindset to be then? Well, you know, when we were in the hospital the first night and they told us that our son would never survive, had to get a, a surgery they couldn't do there, but would never survive the airlift to go get it. So they were just recommending that we leave him there and let him die. Um, I, I remember my one son, my 15 year old said, so it sounds like maybe he'd have a 0.25% chance he could make it. And they said, yeah, that's about right. And he said, okay, we'll take those odds. Miracle mindset says, as long as there's a 0.25% chance, that's not zero. You know, all we need is a little hope. Let's go for it. We then the next day stood in the hospital and I told Grant, who was you know, in a coma, I said, you're going to be 110%, honey. You just need to fight. I need you to fight. And I think it's the being able to see the possibility, being open to the possibility, staying positive, going for the impossible. Just today I was talking to him and I said, honey, you know, because he was frustrated. It's been six years now and he was frustrated. He couldn't remember. He was reading Plato today and he's frustrated. He couldn't remember it. I'm like. Honey, very, most people ne would never read Plato. So the fact that you're reading Plato after you nearly died, you've got a severe traumatic brain injury and you can't remember every bit of it. Who cares? It's great. Don't worry about it. You survived death. You're good. You know? Um, so I realized there really were some key components of this that, that make you successful. But I think the bigger part of a growth of a miracle mindset is really the distinction between uh, and this is Carol Dweck from Stanford's work, not mine, but she talks about a fixed mindset. And that really is that person who thinks life happens to them. Um, they're the victim, right? And they would have looked at this whole thing that happened and when I can't believe my son got hit by a car and I can't believe this woman did this. And we looked at all of this and went, wow, I can't believe he survived that. This is amazing. He's going to be better than before, you know? So it's how do you look at these things? And it's really the difference between thinking that you're a victim of your circumstances or a victor of your circumstances and that you can grow through these things and that you really, you know, things are going to happen to you, but how you respond to them is completely your choice. And so a day can be the worst day of your life, or it could be the best day of your life, depending on how you look at it. And I'm not going to say that wasn't a really scary time because it was, and there still are scary times ahead, but life is really about how we react to things, right? And how we show up. Yeah. And didn't you find like when you're in the hospital that you have to be your son's advocate? Like you have to be, I mean, he can't be, right? Oh and my gosh. You can't just trust it that the doctors are going to know what's best, right? Well, you know, the doctors told us to let him die. Um, and I have the medical records from that first hospital in this very angry doctor, very angry at me 
for not for overruling him. And I'm seeing her and I asked another doctor that night, I go, what would you do if it was your son? He goes, I'd airlift him to the other hospital. <laughs> I'm like, of course you would. Like, he's still alive. No one's going to, no parent's going to just lay that one down. Are you kidding? Um, but we do. And here's the thing. Doctors are people. Most of my closest friends are doctors. It's the world I work in. They're not God. They're people. They're going to make the best decision with yeah. them. They're trying. Absolutely. Yeah, that's it. They're making yeah. the best decision. But here's the thing. You're we were at Harbor UCLA. We had the most amazing doctor, Dr. Carlos Donaire. He saved Grant's life multiple times. But these doctors are going to do the best they can do in the situation that they have. And then you've got a teaching hospital with staff changing all the time. Things slip through the cracks. You know, if you look at like number three ca leading cause of death is death by doctor. And it doesn't mean some doctor tried to kill somebody. It just means stuff slips through the cracks, wrong medications, something, you know, mishap in a surgery. It just it just happens. Right. I mean, so I'm not going anywhere. I was absolutely staying put. And I was there at ground rounds every morning. The hospital, the doctors weren't too thrilled with that. And basically calling up all my friends to find out what more we could do and just being involved, which um, at first they thought I was like a pain in the butt mom. And then, uh, you know, I think they kind of caught wind that that I was not going to know that he was not going to not walk because first they told me he wasn't going to walk again. I said, of course he's going to walk. Treat it like he's Kobe Bryant. If he was Kobe Bryant in bed, you wouldn't be telling Kobe that. Don't tell him. We, of course, he's going to walk, you know. So, you know, Grant runs now. So that's crazy. You know, so we do. Yeah, you know, we have to be in anywhere along the line. As I wrote this book, things could have gone sideways. And that's when I got really clear. It really wasn't about grant healing it was about how we were showing up and believing during this process but you do have to be an advocate i uh i really think there should be a career out there um a, a patient advocate career because i was fortunate in that my ex-husband is a medical malpractice trial attorney his whole family are doctors and 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 uh, medical attorneys and so he is used to all of this right and um, super patient. And so we worked really well together to get Grant what he needed. But I think a lot of people, if the first doctor said, you have to let your son go, would have listened. And that scares me because you got to remember that, you know, you're getting opinions. You're getting opinions. That's it. That's what you're getting. And you, you hear so often those stories, Linda, about how someone's told they have six months to live and they live six months, right? You know, someone's yeah, told them it's, it's totally what they're yeah. believing, right? They're believing what they're told. So we yeah. believe you're never better than when you're challenged. So the minute, so we told, we tell Grant, we nicknamed him Grant Never Gonna. And we just, we just absolutely told him you're going to prove everybody wrong on everything and just challenged him on it. So, you know, that's what we tell him now when things are rough, we're like, you survived death. This is not a big deal. He's like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I know absolutely. I love your title like today, Warrior Mom, because don't you love that miracle so mindset? Much. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I love it, and and I I have to relate this to my brother almost dying this summer and having to fight for his life. What it happened? was it was like what you said, a warrior. He literally was in the hospital, um, having abscess, having losing everything he he's six foot two he was like down to 118 pounds he's like sick and dying in the hospital from we don't even know what from it's like shutting down all his organs he's turning yellow wow um and yeah so it, it was crazy because it, he had this neuralgia before that which is it's like this you know what it, it shuts your nerves to, like your nerves go crazy and it's painful and they call it the suicide disease basically because it's very painful. And he had been in agony with this for three years. And I mean, anybody that sees him, your heart is just like, oh my God, how can someone be in that much pain all the time with their with this neuralgia? So he had that, which it caused him to lose weight because he can't sleep, he can't eat, it was bad. And then um, whatever this thing was that happened to him, he had this abscess and it just, he got sick and he was losing all his food and he was losing everything. And his organs were beginning to shut down his kidneys, his, his liver, his pancreas, they were worried that he wasn't going to make it. 
And so this is sudden and we're in the hospital and, you know, I didn't know if he was going to make it. He didn't know if he was going to make it, but I was fighting for him. Like I, like when you say warrior, I am like, that is just an accurate description of what I went through and just going to bat for him with the doctors and they had turned off his fluids. That was a mistake. Somebody did it by accident and lucky that we were there to be an advocate. Yeah. Huh? I was like, yeah. Oh. And so, yeah. So I'm just saying like, thank God we were there that night because that's when he turned the corner. I got mm-hmm. in there. We fought for him. He got his fluids. He started fighting for himself. You know, we were fighting for him and then he started fighting for himself. And pretty soon the doctor came in and I was saying, Hey, what about this neuralgia? Can you take care of that while he's in here? Because I think that's the whole start of the everything that he has. And um, then the doctor's like, who's the firecracker? <laughs> you know? He wants to know who's the person here that's going to bat for him. But I'm just, long story short, warrior mindset, 100%. We got our miracle. He no longer has neuralgia. Yay. Did they ever figure out what it was? With the um, abscess that sent him to the hospital. I almost, I hate to say this, but I almost feel like it was a miracle because that's what got him the surgery for the neuralgia if he he never goes to the hospital for anything you can't get him in there so here he's in the hospital and they think it's um possibly some food that he he got from peru they think caused the abscess and for him to get deathly ill huh it was crazy it was crazy but it was sudden you know what i mean yeah yeah so so how did how did you develop the mindset that you had to have with your son being basically they're telling you he's not going to make it. And how did you develop this mindset that you were like, no, he he is going to make it. Like, what did you do to develop that? Well, thankfully I, I had it already before then. And that is, um, you know, a couple of things I learned going through this because I'm in, I work in weight loss <clears throat> and in weight loss, everybody tells you they'll start tomorrow. Right. And um, I kept thinking at the time I was so healthy going in, thankfully, because I had to be like all in. But the other piece of it was I developed this mindset early on that was why I was able to pull this all off. And When I was 30, I had this client. I was a personal trainer. I was in graduate school. And I had this amazing client who was a self-made multimillionaire. She grew up in Kansas in a trailer park. And she had a baby out of wedlock and um, basically sold insurance and became a millionaire selling insurance, then moved on from there, right? And just, I mean, amazing woman. And I'm I'm her personal trainer. And I was in grad school and she goes, why are you in grad school? And I said, I want to like be able to help more people. She goes, huh? All right. What are you gonna do when you graduate? I go, I'm going to go to doctoral school. (laughs) She goes, why? I go, cause I want to help more people. So I'm just going to keep going to school. And she was like, you know, that's not necessarily going to help you help more people. And I was like, really? Cause that's how I've been raised. You just go to school. Then you keep going to school and you go to more school. There was like no plan in place. And she goes, no, no, if you want to be successful in business, I'll teach you. So I literally, Linda, put my stuff in storage and moved into her house and sold my business and started learning from her. And I thought she was going to teach me how to be successful and get my message out to the world. And for months, she didn't teach me anything about business and how to get my message out. She just started working. Like the very first thing she had me do was put a rubber band around my wrist And every time I thought of a limiting belief or a negative belief, I had to snap myself and say, cancel, cancel. And I thought, well, this is the stupidest thing ever. You know, when are you going to teach me something I can use? (laughs) And uh, it was amazing how much that got into me. And then she taught me to manage my environment and manage the people I was around, what I listened to, what I learned. I started listening to all these tapes. It was back in the days of the big Walkman with the tapes. And I used to buy these things from Nightingale Conant and listen to Zig Ziglar and Brian Tracy and oh, and, I love uh, Zig Ziglar. right yeah. um, and she just taught me all these things the only limitations and I remember when she first told me the only limitations are the limitations in your mind well thank god she told me this 
And at the time she told me, I thought that's ridiculous. Those are not the only limitations, right? I was a very black and white thinker. <laughs> of course there are limitations. And she said, there is no right or wrong. There just is. I'm like, of course there's right or wrong, you know? And, but <laughs> she just, you know, there are no victims, only volunteers. She just kept saying these things to me and they, they get in. And so that's how I thought. So when you think there are no limitations, only the limitations, your mind, and they're telling you your son's going to die. I'm like, no, he's not. You know, he's going to be 110%, not even, not even 100%. He's going to be better than before the accident, which he actually is now better than before the accident. But it was because I literally lived with this woman for six months and got indoctrinated into thinking differently. And what's so cool is you can think differently, right? We can control these things. And again, that allowed me to show up in such a different way. And you know what's super cool about it? Because she used to teach me and think about it. Um, when has life been really great? Everything's going well. You know, it's just perfect. And you grew. You became a better person. Like, it never happens. We become better through, through trials, challenges, difficulties. In fact, we're never better than when we're challenged. And... Um, so like, as I'm going through this, I'm watching how my 15 year old son is, is dealing with things, standing up to the doctor, telling the doctor, we're going to take those odds. We're going to overrule you. Like what 15 year old says that to a doctor and in there walks up to my son, Grant, who's on a stretcher and he's got a tube coming out of his brain. He's on a ventilator. He's in a deep coma. He looks like the incredible Hulk. He's so swollen. He's got road rash down his body. He's got bones sticking through his skin. I'm looking going, oh my gosh. those are bones. I'm like, oh my gosh. And Bryce walks up to him and goes, dude, you look really ugly right now. But if anyone can make it through it, you can. You are the toughest guy I know. You've got this. You're going to make it through it. I'll see you over at the other hospital. I'm like, okay. You know, so, like, so this stuff wears off. Like if you want to have strong, resilient kids, be strong and resilient. If you want your kids to be healthy, be healthy. You know, so it, it's been really incredible to watch. And as my son was coming through this, came home from the hospital after four and a half months and as being overprotective, um, which is easy to do once you've almost lost a kid. And I realized that was not working for him and that the way to help my son be better was to push him, was to make him know that he could do anything that, you know, this wasn't going to be something that defined him, that it defined how he could, what he could achieve in life because of it. So the minute I turned it into, of course you can do that. You were dead on the street and you got up and did this. This will be easy. He's like, Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, well, your belief made him believe in himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the positivity is catching. They've proven this through statistics. When you're around a negative person, you're, you actually become more negative. And so you being positive like that, I, I did a whole podcast on they feed off, you know, how they feed off your energy. They need your energy. And you brought that energy to him and... I feel like that is one of the biggest things that helped him through. Yeah. And by the energy. way, um, it was interesting because he told us afterwards, he was in a coma for weeks and I was super careful about everything being said around him. And he was, after that, it took him months to come through it, but he was super aware of everything going on. Um, and he told us afterwards, he told us about deciding, I'm going to turn my sound down. Oops. That's my light. My sound's going a little crazy here. Yeah, hang on. Uh, there you go. Do you hear that? Yes. Did I, I, use it? I don't have an we'll answer. Edit it oh. for the for the um for iTunes. We'll just edit okay. it out. Siri's going crazy over there. Shush it, Siri. Anyway, um, okay. But what was I talking about? Now I went off on a rant, and then I don't remember. What I, <laughs> <laughs> I do that. <laughs> Oh, you know, yeah. no, I've never done that before. Lost. <laughs> well, that noise was kind of alien sounding. <laughs> it was like, rah, 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 rah. and then I hit something and then Siri started. I, know. Now I, like, hear Siri, you I didn't ask you a question. I'm pretty sure. Stop talking. <laughs> no sound. Hang on. Uh, I'm not sure what happened. Oh, wow. Okay. There we go. Are we back? Yes, that was crazy. Okay. Never had that either. <laughs> there are, there clearly are aliens on our <laughs> show today. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, we are talking about some pretty cool things. And uh, how do you think this whole mindset, you know, not having limiting beliefs and, you know, training your mind, rewiring your brain, how does that all tie into being more healthy? Um, well, here's something interesting. When I, a couple years ago, we did a deep dive survey uh, to our whole list and asking them if they weren't where they wanted to be with their weight and their health, why not? And it was an open-ended question. So you could write in anything you wanted. And I fully thought, oh, they're going to write in like, I can't give up sugar or gluten or cheese or whatever, right? And the number one question people said to me as to why they weren't as healthy as they, they wanted to be, why they couldn't lose weight, was because they didn't feel worthy. They didn't matter. They didn't feel good enough. They weren't going to put themselves first. My real mission with republishing Miracle Mindset as Warrior Mom and doing this contest that I'm going to do every year around Mother's Day is that if you really want to be like the matriarch of your family, like raise healthy kids, have a healthy spouse, do well in your career, make an impact out there in the world, leave an incredible legacy, it must start with you. You cannot be last on the list that your self-care is going to be the single most important thing that you do. When I was at the hospital that first night holding Grant's three fingers, the only thing that wasn't rubbed, you know, raw with road rash or casted, I looked at him and I realized that the only way I was going to be able to pull this off was if I put my health first, because I had to be there for him and make these life and death decisions and you can't get sick when your son's in the ICU. I walked in with a mask and a gown and gloves. You're not sick. If you're sick, they don't let you in. So I couldn't be sick. I had to be able to think straight and make life and death decisions. I had to be doing interviews. I had a little room that UCLA gave me to do interviews out of. And I had to make my book launch go. We have pictures of me sitting next to him in the ICU with my laptop open, talking to him because I knew he could hear me and um, working on my book launch. And so I just had the only way I was going to pull that off. I looked at the whole thing and I went, all right, my health comes first, then my son, then this book. So it was basically health, two kids, book. And that was it. And everything else gone. I took everything else off the table, but I, I look at so many women who put their health and themselves last. They don't even get on their to-do list. Oh, for sure. And it, and feeling like that's a martyr. I want to get rid of martyr syndrome. It just drives me crazy. But yeah. you are not, you're not going to raise healthy kids if they see you treating yourself like a second class citizen. Guess what? You know, that's what they're going to think they have to do too. That is not a healthy way to be. So you want healthier kids? Put yourself first. Put your health first. Eat healthy stuff. And that's what I did in the hospital. I was getting my sleep. I was exercising. I was eating correctly. I took loads of supplements. I just made sure I did what I needed to do. I reached out. I, had a, I reached out to all my friends for help. I did things to help manage my stress. And because I knew that if I didn't do that, I wasn't going to be able to pull it off. What would you say to people who feel like they could never do what you did? You know, you have no idea what you're capable of until you're in the situation. But the other thing you want to do is make sure like if you, uh, you you wouldn't want to get thrown in the deep end of a pool not knowing how to swim. So ideally, having a better mindset helps you in every area of your life every single day. It is the big determinant of someone being successful or not. You don't want to wait till you're in the middle of a crisis to go, now it's time to start thinking positively. Like you got to train yourself so that when those things hit, it's who you are and how you show up, right? I mean, I didn't have to think when this all hit that I'm like, I'm going to have to think about him being 110%. No, it was just how I behaved. Um, but I do believe that we're never better than when we're challenged. We think, I had so many people say I could never do that. I go, boy, when you're like looking at your son hovering between life and death, you'd be amazed what you're willing to do. I would yeah. bet you do anything, right? Yes, well, absolutely. And I mean, you saw it with your brother. It's like, what were you willing to do? Whatever it takes. Yeah, whatever it took. And yeah. it's a miracle. It really is a miracle because there's no cure for what he had, neuralgia. 
And um, so I'm just- My you know, son was dead on the street. So oh, yeah. it's yeah. like, that's what these things are. And there's no medical explanation for how he got through this. Like, it doesn't make any sense, you know, that that he could have survived the airlift in that, that surgery. I mean, we had an amazing doctor, but these things, that's why you, you just gotta grab onto hope, plow through it and show up as your best self and take whatever happens you know it's like i i went plowed through it and went i don't know what's going to happen but i'm just going to keep showing up right and uh the biggest thing that i've seen with my family is that we are all better because of it and we're closer because of it we're better people because of it and you again gratitude like don't you just you know. feel just this fierce gratitude well i also had trained myself to feel fierce gratitude prior to um because i think that it could go either way if you hadn't. So someone else, and, and I got asked plenty of times, what they, did they ever find the woman? They hit your kid. I'm like, I never think about the woman. Like I forgave the woman. And so I, for, for years, one of the things this woman taught me to do, Kay, was she taught me to pull out a journal every morning and write at least three things I was grateful for. So I've been journaling forever. And so when you think about it, here's a way you can control your mindset throughout the day is the first thing in the morning, find three things you're grateful for. Because if you wake up angry, scared, and you push gratitude in, it will shove those things out of the way. They can't coexist. So when I'm waking up in the morning in a crappy little hotel room, realizing, you know, when you first wake up, oh yeah, this nightmare is happening to me. And you go, he's in a great hospital. He's alive. And I'm, I have the money to be able to stay nearby him and actually be bedside. You know, I saw so many parents at Children's Hospital LA when I was there who couldn't be there with their kids all the time because of their jobs. But I built a business so I could work from anywhere. Now I built a business so I could work from the beach, but it was also very helpful to be able to work from a hospital room. So that's what I did. Um, and then during the day, if things went sideways, what I found to be easy, and I use this a lot at home now, things are going sideways. If you text someone and you tell them what you appreciate about them, you will get back big love back. So that can get you out of your way and do a state shift. And then at night, I always look at three wins for the day, three little miracles. I call this my jam, my gratitude, appreciation, and miracles. But like at the end of the day, what were three things that went well today? Because we never look at that, right? You know, we're always on, I, I'm like a very motivated, ambitious person. So I'm already on to the next day and what I'm going to accomplish instead of like, what happened today that was awesome. And there's always awesome things that happen, even if it's as simple as I like nailed my steamed broccoli, you know, like I did the perfect amount of steaming. I mean, it's like, it can be that little, right? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I, and I remember what you said about him, like, coming through and you knew he was going to be okay you you're like oh he's going to be he's going to make it through this and and i still i had the same kind of moment when my brother had brain surgery because he had a tumor that caused all this ah. and uh when he came out of it he made jokes about austin powers <laughs> we're like, like be okay he's going to be all right he made Maybe it through not. his brain is working <laughs> He had neuralgia for three years and they never figured out it was a brain tumor? No. How is that? Oh, How you know, I, I know, right? It's, um, I don't, I don't know why that is. And I'm actually the one that suggested that possibly it was a tumor. Wow. <laughs> so, so anyway, just all of that just makes you feel this intense gratitude and I watched your video before all this came down in, in our lives. Uh, I saw your whole miracle. I watched the video, the movie, oh, the boy. whole thing. And I think, you know, and I'm here with you today just because I learned how to let go of my limiting beliefs. I didn't even realize I had them. And uh, we, don't, I was, well, we don't know our limit. Like we wouldn't know. How would you know? Yeah. You know, I, I, I thought it was the most positive out. thing on the planet. Hey, thinking too small there, you know. <laughs> well, literally, I had this moment at this summit uh, with Isaiah Hankel, the author of The Black Hole Focus. And he's like talking about limited beliefs. We had to do a work, you know, this workshop. And I started realizing how many I had. And so we had to do the perfect day scenario and on my perfect day scenario was podcasting with celebrities. And here we are. 
here we are. Here we are, podcasting with JJ. <laughs> and uh, you are the celebrity health coach. So who, what celebrities have you trained? Well, you know what? I haven't worked with celebrities for years and years. Um, I stopped working with people one-on-one, -on -one, gosh, mm, seven, eight years ago. I mean, prior to that, I worked with Gene Simmons and Brandon Routh and Ben Stiller and Gene Garoppolo oh, cool. and uh, Gene Triplehorn. But then I stopped all of that. And I'm actually in a career transition now um, where I still have my personal brand and, you know, we do a lot a lot of um, ongoing content to get out to the world. I want, I never want someone to say, oh, I couldn't get healthy because I couldn't afford it. So there's absolutely no excuse there. Are, all the excuses are gone. The only roadblock generally is someone is, is themselves. Um, but now my biggest dream, I want to help a billion people get healthy. So my big thing now is finding other health experts, docs and influencers and helping them go out with their message. So that's what I've been spending the majority of my time doing. It's more of that. I love that. So with all this media and the things that we can do socially on the internet, it makes it much easier to reach more people. Yes. Isn't it cool? It's yeah. really good. Yeah. You know, when you look at it, it's, it's good and not in, and, and challenging at the same time, because you can reach so many more people, but there's so much noise. And there's the challenge of who do you listen to? Who do you believe? There's so much crazy information out there. Um, so that's one of the things I try to do on my podcast is really bring in amazing guests and uh, get people exposed to some of the coolest, brilliant docs that I've met out there in the world. So I'm fortunate to have some pretty amazing friends in the health, in the health world. That's awesome. What, what, uh, can you walk me through the version diet and how it works? I know that's like your big, you know, thing is, it's just all these, all these books and your diet you created. These books. I never planned to do a book. Um, <laughs> so I've always been obsessed with weight loss and um, I was in graduate school and I remember at the time everything was about eat less, exercise more. And I could see pretty quickly that that wasn't really working well. Most of my clients were premenopausal and it just was, uh, you know, it was super frustrating. So I was like, all right, if it's not calories in, calories out, what is it? And I started searching for all the things that could get in you the way of you losing weight or could cause you to gain weight, thyroid, hormones, uh, stress, sleep. And one of the things that I landed on was what was going on with the gut. Back then we didn't even know the microbiome. No one was talking about it. And, and uh, I was doing, I was going to doctor's offices and teaching them how to use different types of functional tests to help get their patients better. And one of them was a food sensitivity test. And what I discovered was we were doing these tests to help people coming in that were feeling um, tired or achy or had autoimmune disease or joint pain or skin problems, headaches, brain fog, food cravings. And so we would do these food tests and the same foods kept showing up, right? And so we would take the test, send the test out. They'd come back. We'd pull the foods out. A week later, they're like, you're a genius. They'd feel so much better. But what I noticed was, since it was always the same foods, what I started to do was take the test, pull the foods out that I suspected anyway, because it was always the same foods. And then they'd come back for their test results, and they'd feel amazingly better and we didn't need the test. And so what I decided was, why don't I just pull the foods out, the most common suspects, and then have them do that for three to four weeks. It's kind of a detox. They reset to a new normal. They now know what feeling good really feels like. And then we go back one by one and we challenge those foods and we see which foods work and which foods don't. Because truthfully, who cares what a test says if you eat a food and it hurts you? It doesn't matter. So I just said, went, forget that. I'm just going to pull the food out, have them test it, see how they feel, and go from there. And so that is what the virgin diet is, is it's a modified elimination diet. Because what I saw when I was doing food sensitivity testing was the foods that you pull out in the elimination diet weren't the ones that I was seeing people react to in the testing. So 
that's what the virgin diet is, is I just pulled all those foods out. You go through a process where you swap them out for foods that heal your gut. Then you come back one by one and you test and you develop a diet that will work for you, that reduces inflammation, gets rid of cravings, helps you lose weight effortlessly, have great steady sustained energy, and is specific to you because we're all different, right? So, I mean, it made it, uh, it's, it's a very simple way to customize a diet that can work for you for the long haul. And uh, my friends, all my doctor friends were like, well, that's so obvious. I'm like, I know. I know that was the funniest, you know, when you're just doing something going, this is so obvious, you know, <laughs> why isn't anyone doing this? Yeah, that was it. How about fruit? Can I, how much of that can we have? So then after I wrote the virgin diet, the biggest question I had asked was about sugar. And I realized that people are totally confused about sugar. You know, they're like, what about fruit? It's free food. I'm like, fruit's not free food. And, uh, you know, they were confused about that and artificial sweeteners and honey. So that's where the sugar impact diet came in was to really get clear on carbohydrates, like where the virgin diet's all about food intolerance. The, the sugar impact diet's about carb intolerance, how to know which carbohydrates, which sugars to choose, which to lose. Should you have fruit? How much fruit should you have? If you're insulin sensitive, um, you don't have diabetes, you don't have elevated triglycerides, you've got a good stable blood sugar, good blood sugar control, one or two pieces of fruit a day, no juice, no dried fruit, no fruit syrups, no fruit concentrates. Um, but if you've got any of those issues, I generally pull fruit out for a while. Uh, but it's definitely not a free fruit. Free food, definitely one or two pieces Oops, I just lost a light. One or two pieces of fruit a day at the most is it. And that's it. What about people that have weight resistance? What What is this? So I was on Dr. Phil for two years when he first launched um, his weight loss shows as his nutritionist. And he had a chapter in his book called Weight Loss Resistance. And I that was like so fascinating to me. Now, he just was talking about insulin. But I went in and I actually created a course for doctors called Overcoming Weight Loss Resistance. I went around the country teaching this. And um, it was everything that could get in the way of you losing weight. And so here's weight loss resistance. You figure out which foods work for you and which foods don't. You lower your sugar impact. You're eating um, two to three meals a day, maybe one snack. You're, you're eating within a normal feeding window, giving yourself a good 12 to 14 hour overnight fast. You're doing all that and you're still not losing weight. You're weight loss resistant. And then we have to figure out, is it your gut microbiome? Is it thyroid function? Is it uh, adrenal function, something to do with your stress and your sleep? Is it toxicity creating hormone disruption? Is it insulin and leptin resistance? Is it your genetics? What is going on that's creating these issues? And oftentimes it's a web of these things because, you know, when you have stress, it impacts your thyroid. When you have your thyroid impact, it impacts your sex hormones, right? So everything plays together. Stress creates insulin resistance, right? So all these things can work together, but that's weight loss resistance. And to me, if you're overweight, it's a sign something's not working right with your metabolism. And we just got to figure out what it is. And that's why I always start with step one is making sure that you've dialed in your diet, figure out which foods work for you and which foods don't. You've lowered your sugar impact and then you figure out where you should be on the carbohydrate you know, impact scale. Because if you've got issues with adrenal and thyroid and estrogen, you should not eat a very low carb diet. It will make you worse, not better. But if you're more insulin resistant. Right, absolutely. Right? And I see people do it all the time. I should go keto. I'm like, you got a thyroid problem. You shouldn't go keto. Keto is going to make right, you, you need worse. more fuel. Right. Yeah. But if you've got, you know, if you've got a brain injury, yeah, you should go keto. So it's different for different people. And we're always trying to take, you know, people are talking about keto being a fad. I'm like, keto is not a fad diet. We're just using it in a fad way. Right. Like keto is a right. very therapeutic diet. It's amazing when you use it correctly for epilepsy, um, for brain injury, it can be amazing, but it's not right for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so this brings me to my next question with menopausal women, 
do you find a special diet? I mean, do you have them do more fat or it, or do you have to have them all have hormone testing? How do you go about that? So someone going into menopause, the first thing you want to do is really get their diet dialed in. And it's a, you know, a real balanced diet. Cause if you go too low of carbohydrate and have too low insulin, then you're going to have lower estrogen and you're going to feel worse, not better. The, the biggest thing you want to make sure of as you're going into menopause is that your adrenal health is as healthy as possible because you're going to need your adrenal glands to produce hormones as you go through uh, menopause. So you want to really, it's, it's here, you'll hear the stereo go, oh my gosh, I was 48 when my son got hit. I was just heading into all of this. My thyroid went sideways, my course. I mean, it just was like, boof, you know? So the, roof. the worst thing you can do is go through extreme stress when you're getting ready to go into menopause. You want to make sure your adrenals are working really well. You've got your thyroid dialed. So super critical because um, so many of us, I've got uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis that's now, of course, controlled through um, diet and some thyroid replacement. But you want to do as much as you can through diet and lifestyle before you go into bioidentical hormones. So, and there's so much that you can do so that if you do need to use bioidentical hormones, that you're using the lowest amount possible to, you know, be better. So for me, I use um, an estrogen patch. I cycle progesterone a week out of the month and I do a testosterone shot and I do some thyroid and I'm awesome. But without that stuff, I would not be, <laughs> I'd be a mess, but yeah, I my food relate. styled in, my stress, <laughs> you know, I, I do adrenal testing and my adrenals are perfect, like absolutely picture perfect. It took me about four and a half years to recover from Grant's accident with my adrenals. A lot of work there to get them back. Oh, yeah, I, I bet. I bet. Yeah. Yep. What kind of support system did you have to have around you? to be able to manage your book taking off, your son in the hospital, yourself. I mean, how did you develop this? Well, fortunately I had a good team before this happened. I didn't have enough of a team, um, but at least I had some people who'd been with me forever. And I made a point of asking for help. And I think that's the most important thing. When this whole thing happened, one of the first actions that I took was to send an email out to my entire community and to my and post on Facebook of what was going on and that I needed support. I said, I don't need like, I don't need, you know, sympathy. I just need support. Like here are the things that I need. And I was very specific about it because, you know, when you ask for help, you have to be specific because people do want to help, but they need to know what the heck to do. And especially in a situation like that, no one knows what to do didn't know what to do. Like, how do you work with something like that? So I was very specific about what, you know, things I wanted, any ideas about what the latest was to help someone come through a coma and a traumatic brain injury. I needed that. I needed people to bring food to the hospital. That's what I need help with. And I needed help during my launch. And I got a massive community support during my launch because I just reached out and said, this is what's going on. This is what I need. And people are like, okay. So I think the biggest step is being very specific and asking for help. I love that because I think so many of us think we have to do everything alone. And you know, if you can't always do everything alone, you have to have help. You have to have a team. What are some suggestions for people that maybe don't already have a support team to, to nurture that, to grow that, to start finding a team or some support. Yeah. One of the first things I do a lot of business coaching now. And uh, one of the first things that I coach people on is getting a team around them. And the first thing is, you know, you've got things that you're really good at and that you would do, whether you got paid to do them or not, that's your unique ability. That's ultimately your goal is to just do that. But when you first start out, you're doing everything. So you're doing stuff that you suck at that you hate. Then you're doing stuff that you don't like, but you're good at right? Then you're doing stuff that you like and you're good at. Then you're doing stuff you love. The very first goal is to get rid of the stuff you suck at that you hate. 
So probably things like bookkeeping, cleaning the house, right? I mean, look at, I actually have two executive assistants and a personal assistant. I don't want to do because I'm trying to just work now my unique ability, but I started with getting a, I had a personal assistant when I was in college because I recognized back then that I was a personal trainer paying my way through college at UCLA and at the time, I remember I started, this was in the early 80s. I was one of the first personal trainers. And my first gigs were $35 an hour, but I could pay someone $10 an hour to do my personal help. And I'm like, well, if I could pay them $10 an hour and I can make $35 an hour, I can work more. This makes sense. I shouldn't ever go to the grocery store or anything else. So I'd, I've had personal assistance ever since because if you can have someone do something faster, cheaper, or better, you should not do it. Right. So um, that is the first step is look at all of the stuff that you could immediately offload easily. And that's usually household stuff, errands and accounting, bookkeeping stuff. Those are the easiest ones to me to get to get gone fast. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And. I can totally attest to what you're saying. Once I got one assistant, I had to have two more because you start realizing, why did I wait so long? This is great. And you accomplish so much more. Not only do you accomplish more, you are actually making a bigger, um, you're helping other people too who love doing what they're doing. Like I've had someone um, who started working with me 20 years ago and she's worked with me for 20 years. And guess what? She's able to work out of her house. Her husband's got a very scary disease called ankylosing spondylitis. She's able to be there with him, work out of her house. Oh my gosh, my friend has that. Oh, it's a horrible disease. It's so rare. It's a rare, it's rare. Yeah. So, but she's, yeah. she's able to work out of her house and take care of him because of this, right? So you look at what you're able to do because you can step up, you can bring other people in too that now are doing the things they love to do. And you're, you know, it's, you're helping everybody. So I'm always looking for how to go to the next level and bring more people in. And I'm really proud of being able to have so many people on. I have two, two companies and two teams and, you know, that's making a difference out there in the world, especially because I try to, as much as possible, I have a lot of, um, you know, moms who work with me, right? And now they can work around their schedule with their kids. They can work out of their house. I mean, how awesome is that? It's pretty awesome. And, and I love that you're talking about that today on our Warrior Mom podcast, where we're going to have tons of moms listening that it's one of the most important things is asking for help and getting support. That's what we all need. And I'm just so impressed with everything that you have said today. And one thing I was really curious about is how did you um, get started into all of this? I mean, what spurred you into the whole fitness realm? Um, I grew up in Berkeley, California, which is kind of a farm to table place. I started going to health food stores in my early teens. I started, I started in my first dance class, like at age five. And then I started teaching dance and calisthenics early on. So I kind of always was into it. Um, you know, I taught dance all through high school and then went off to college, started teaching aerobics in college. And then someone came to the aerobic studio and wanted a personal trainer. They didn't call it that because there was no personal trainers. It was literally me and body by Jake. They just said, can you come to my house and help? Cause they didn't want to come to the studio. I'm like, okay. So I, I was using my own body weight to, to push, you know, there weren't really, you know, it was just when gyms were starting and I was starting to manage gyms as part of my uh, side gig while I was in college Um, and by the time I graduated from college, all my friends were off getting jobs and I had a big six figure income as a personal trainer working part time, paying my way through grad school. So I was like, I'm not going to go do those, that silly job where you're getting paid nothing. And it's like, you're in an office that's torture. (laughs) Just as Ben, you know, I, I, I've been fortunate in that I've always done 
what I've been obsessed with. Like I've always been obsessed with health, with nutrition, with fitness. I also love, um, love everything related to science. And I also have always loved psychology and advertising and marketing. And, um, you know, nothing happens when you really look at the best personal trainers, the best nutritionists, they're the best at sales, because you got to sell someone on changing their life on eating the broccoli on going to bed early or on moving more. And so I've also been obsessed with teaching other health experts how to market themselves, how to sell what they do, because that's the only way we change the world. People have to commit. They have to commit with their time and with their wallet. And when someone makes the commitment to get healthier and they plunk down some money to do so, then you can get to work. But until they do that, they haven't made a commitment. Nothing changes. Right. It is a commitment in their minds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like that's yep. absolutely true. I wish, you know, I have a free challenge going on where we take people through seven days of the virgin diet, because I know that in seven days I can give them a win. They can see a big change and they commit with their clients. So they do make that commitment. But in my perfect world, I would charge someone to start just slightly more than what they can afford. Because once you do that, you've got them. They're in and they're going to focus and they're going to start moving. And they're that, investing in themselves. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I look at my biggest failures when I first was starting. It was when I wanted to help people for free and they never got the results, right? Because they just hadn't invested. Because you wanted it for them more than they wanted mm -hmm. it for them, right? Yeah. They I have haven't made a commitment them. and it is all about that. I had a great mentor early on who said, never get more committed than your client. You know, it's just don't do it. And they will commit with their wallet. And I'm like, that is such a great point. <laughs> so, you know, that is an important thing. I'll hear people say, oh, I couldn't afford that. I'm like, you actually can't afford not to. Um, that's the bottom line. You, you want to stretch. You want to do things. And it's funny because every time I've ever stretched in my life and, and gone out and done something that I thought I couldn't afford, well, I never actually think that way. I always think about what do I need to get to the next level in my life and my career and my health. And I go do that. And it's not a matter of whether I can afford it. I think it's more of you can't afford not to. And it always works out. It just always does. What, what is one of your greatest success stories from all this training and working with people? There are literally have been like, you know, I mean, I've, I've taken a million plus people through all this stuff. So there's thousands and thousands of them. But I remember there was um, this family and it was so interesting because this woman got the information for my program because her ex-husband watched my public television show for the Virgin Diet called Drop Seven Foods, Feel Better Fast. He watched the show. He and his wife went on it and then he pinged his ex-wife about it, which could have could have gone poorly right you know but his ex-wife has ha had had health problems her whole life thyroid issues thyroid cancer and the doctor had said to her you know if you don't lose weight like you're gonna die you can't you have to lose weight but and he literally says this to her he says but losing weight for you is going to be like taking a wheelbarrow filling it full of bricks and pushing it up a sand dune I mean, who says this? Who says this? So this is her thinking, okay, well, I'm supposed to lose weight, but you just told me it was impossible. Anyway, ex-husband tells her about this program. Now, she goes on the program, but she also has a son who's 300 pounds plus, who they were going to send off to a, one of those weight loss camps, couldn't lose weight, another son who needed to lose weight, and a husband who needed to lose weight. Everyone goes on it. We, we actually started calling them the 300-pound family because everybody loses the weight. She finally loses the weight. She's healthy. And that's what I love to see. Back when I was a personal trainer, what was exciting to me was if I helped one person in the family, the whole family started to get healthy. But my frustration was that was where it ended. And the big thing I kept looking at was how do I get this message out to the world? And the next thing I know, you know, and I always think you've got to ask the right questions. I was on Dr. Phil and I was on Dr. Phil for two years and I did some other reality TV shows. And it just was like, how do I get this impact out there? And, and that's really why I made the Virgin Diet the way I did was I wanted to make a program that was very easy for people to help other people do that was so simple and that got you a win so quickly because for so many people, they've struggled for so long. They've tried so many things. They're so frustrated. They basically have given up.
right? And the minute you give up and you don't have hope, you're done. And, you know, if you feel like you've tried everything and maybe it's your genes or your age, all that BS that we're told, it's not. You probably have been just following the wrong set of rules. And I know that I can have someone for seven days, you know, go through this free challenge and try it out, pull those foods out, and they're going to feel a difference. Most of the people, the average person loses seven pounds in a week, which is crazy. But I'll have people who've never been able to lose weight who go, gosh, I only lost two pounds. I go, but you've never been able to lose weight. Like, and you lost two pounds, but more importantly, their energy shifts, their food cravings are gone. Their skin clears up. They don't have the congestion. Their headaches are gone. Their brain fog's gone. I'm like, you know, it's dramatic. And so that's what I'm really working on now is I want people to realize that it's, you know, it's, it's simple, not easy. Um, but for so many of us, you know, they just, they've just been duped by misinformation and that in a week you can feel enormously better, but you've got to take responsibility for this. You've got to stop giving responsibility to other people, take personal responsibility for your health and start to really connect the dots between what you're eating and how you feel. But in the first place you start to heal and get better is with your food. Where could people find this free challenge? I'm sure a lot of people are going to want to sign up. So it is at jjvirgin.com forward slash challenge. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's like enough. everything you need right there. We have a private Facebook group that they jump into. It's crazy the things we're reading in that private Facebook group. I've got a team of coaches that are in there supporting. And literally, it is like what you need to have a big win in seven days. So again, I... You know, there are no excuses for not getting healthy. The information's there and it's free. Wow. So I just want to acknowledge you so much for your brilliance, your uh, positivity, your warrior mindset, and just your give back philosophy that you're so giving and wanting to help others. And uh, I just have one question what are three simple truths that you could leave with the audience and they can be even funny or serious? Three simple truths. Let's see. I'll give you the number one way to be successful. Start. That's it. Have a start date. So there's one, one simple truth. Do you want to be successful? Start taking perfect action. Next simple truth is we are never better than when we're challenged. And uh, I love the quote from Wayne Dyer, when you squeeze an orange, you get orange juice. Like what happens when you're squeezed? Cause that's when you really show up. So show up great. And then that final one from my mentor of, you know, the only limitations are the limitations in your mind. So go big. That's why I decided I was going to go for Grant being 110%. I figured if we missed it by a little bit, cool. He's alive, you know? <laughs> so, you know, those are the three that have, that have made a massive difference in my life. Hey, that was great. I loved it. Where can people find you on social media? Uh, Facebook is JJ Virgin official little blue check mark. And on um, Instagram, it's JJ Virgin. And then um, I have a YouTube channel. I have a podcast, JJ Virgin lifestyle show. And I have Pinterest. I think it's just JJ Virgin. And there it is. Thank you. There's the bell. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for taking your time out of your busy schedule today to be with all of us. And thanks everybody for listening today to the Sisterhood of Sweat.